Uh, we want to welcome you to oh, – hi, everybody. <laughs> Sergeant jumped in way too early. We want to welcome you to uh, Wrestling with the Law and Stuff. Um, I know that right now today is probably a very difficult day. The last few days have been very difficult for a variety of people. Uh, and I know I've gotten a lot of messages, texts, and calls. Uh, and I'm going to be honest. There are some people in this world who really I am fed up with talking with and have no interest in talking to again. Uh, there are other people, though, who are approaching from a position of how do I learn? Uh, and that's important. So we appreciate that because there's a lot going on. Uh, I've got someone who we're going to talk to today who he and I were just having kind of a conversation about that uh, just a few minutes ago, how the whole this is real and surreal. Uh, but I want to get into as quickly as possible what it is he does. Mitch Jackson is somebody who has been, uh, in just a short period of time, uh, someone who I consider a friend and a mentor. He's been fantastic. Uh, Mitch is also as many of you may already know, uh, one of the most important people for learning how to use social media, particularly for lawyers, but for other business professionals. Uh, his bona fides are incredible. Uh, he's one of the most well-known active trial lawyers on social media. He's the founder of the Legal Minds Mastermind group, which is a phenomenal group to join. For those of you who are in there, you already know this. He also helps introduce lawyers and other professionals to other fantastic lawyers and other professionals. So it's helped broaden our mind. His book, The Ultimate Guide to Social Media for Business Owners, Professionals and Entrepreneurs was number one bestseller on Amazon uh, and the top number one in uh, new release for two separate categories. So he has really been on a roll. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today and I'm gonna go ahead and jump him on in. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I present to you as well, the wonderful Mitch Jackson. Mitch, hey, Eric, thank you for the very, Eric, it's good to see you. Thanks for thank the very, you. very kind and generous introduction. Well, thank you, Mitch. I, I greatly appreciate it. As I said, you know, one of the great things about this is you are a master storyteller. And as you know, one of the themes we come up with here is being able to tell stories, that lawyers are, are storytellers, and the best way to tell stories is learning other people's stories. It helps you identify with juries and potential clients, and it makes you better at it. When did you start to figure out that the social media was a great way for lawyers to tell their stories, not just about the their practices, but about themselves? When did you start to figure it out? And what was the first social media platform that made that uh, clear for you? Why don't we start things off with, I'm always intimidated when I'm on a show with you, Eric, okay? <laughs> because you have the gift of being a very effective and persuasive uh, communicator. Um, I, I, I tip my hat to you because it's it's intimidating to be on, on the same show with someone that comes across so human, so genuine in what he says and what he does. And I think that's one of the reasons you and I have connected is lawyers and other professionals that give themselves permission to, to show their human side. And let's be real for a second. Um, we're, we're, we're shooting the show live right now so if you're watching a live or recorded right now where there's a lot going on in the world, yeah, it's a lot going on in the world right now. And um, we're talking about COVID-19. We're talking about uh, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. um, and everything else in protests going on across the country. And I don't think there's a more important time for lawyers and other professionals than right now to show their human side, to be real, to share their thoughts, this, this is the moment right now. And I think for me, Eric, taking all of that into consideration, because I do want to answer your question, um, it comes down to I became a lawyer because I wanted to help people. I became a lawyer because I wanted to take on the wrongdoers, the bullies, the bad guys. And it was hard starting off not knowing anybody in Orange County. I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona. I grew up on a ranch in Tucson. And when I came out here to go to law school, I knew one person, right? And we have some pretty darn good lawyers out here, some pretty well-established law firms. And so after I graduated from law school and passed the bar, you know, it's like, how do you get new clients? How do you become known? How do you become that go-to guy in the community, right? It's a lot yeah. of competition, a lot of good people, a lot of hardworking lawyers. And what I realized is when this thing called the internet rolled out, and in 1995, 1996, Lisa and I, my partners, Lisa Wilson, we met in law school, fell in love, got married. Uh, we put out our first website around 1995, 1996. And about eight months later, we had a million dollar case come to our law firm through the website. 
And it was someone that went to the website, read some of the stories, read about some of our cases. But here's what they told us. Here's what she told us. It was a husband yep. and wife. And she said, Mitch, when I read your story, and in my story, it wasn't your typical lawyer bio. I talked about growing up on a, on a ranch in Tucson, yeah. riding horses and hun hunting and hiking and fishing and playing high school sports and flying hand gliders and racing motocross and all that. She goes, that's what connected me with you because before my son died, those were the things that he enjoyed doing. Okay. And so I've never been accused of being the sharpest knife in the drawer. And you've heard me say that before, but I re realized the reason she went with us and not one of the big established firms was because of that personal connection. And it happened because of something I put on a website. So fast forward another 10 years to when social media came out, what I noticed was these platforms right now, they allow us to communicate in a real time fashion with an unlimited audience engaging in real time to comments and questions and connecting unlike ever before. And it allows you even more so to show your human side. And so when we started doing this, number one, I enjoy doing this. Number two, I like helping people and ask, answering their questions, trying to add value. And number three, I like showing the consumer the human side of lawyers, who we are, what are our hobbies, our interests, our passions. Who are the guys and gals that we hang out with, right? One of them for me is right here, wherever Eric yes, went. That's this right. is one of the guys right here, right? One that's of the right good right people. There. And then you start talking to people who you meet online and you find out you've got mutual friends. You find out you've got mutual interests. You find out that their community is very similar to my community. I think it brings us together, Eric. I think more so than ever before, we as human beings can reach out and connect with other people we would have never met we would have never talked to, and we would have never known. And I think for all those reasons, um, social has been a fun experience and a meaningful experience in my life. See, now it's not funny you mentioned that because one of the things you and I connected on, obviously, was finding out that one of your closest friends, actually two of your closest friends, are judges right here in the Inland Empire. That, that That's right. My old roommate. My old roommate. Uh, I don't think we need to mention names. I don't know if we no, should. No, not, no, we but, don't, no, we don't. But want to so, so, so going through law school, my roommate for three years, uh, you know, dear friend of mine is now a judge out where Eric practices and his girlfriend back then, who's now his wife and has been for probably 30 years, yep. uh, happens to be a judge out there too. So what a small world, right? It, it can be. And an old friend yeah. of mine actually has their office just, I think, maybe a half mile away from, from yours. Uh, incredible growth on that law firm. Maybe one of these we'll, we'll get him on here uh, sooner or later. So let's talk about as you were developing, you know, seeing with social <clears throat> media, first of all, what was the first platform that grabbed your attention? And secondly, as a follow-up, when did you figure out that being personal on that platform was going to work for you? Because as you know, this profession, often we are told, be conservative, be conservative, don't take chances. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to blend in mm -hmm. and, and be <clears throat> the same as anyone else in town, then that's the advice you want to follow, right? If you don't want to blend in, if you want to stand out, if you want to take your brand from local to global, if you want to go from un being unknown to unforgettable, then you want to do things different than everyone else in town. And it just so happens, Eric, that when it comes to lawyers, showing your human side, sharing your why, why do you get out of bed each morning? What, what, what made you become a lawyer? What do you enjoy doing? What are your hobbies, your interests and passions? Sharing all of those things, I think, is what connects us as lawyers. And when all said and done, brings in new business, new people that you can help. Eric, it's very similar to when we're trying cases, when you and, you and I both try cases. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize is we have a case and we may have it for one or two, three years. I just posted a case I handled out in your neck of the woods a few years ago. We had the case for five years before we went to trial. There just weren't any courtrooms available. Yeah. And um, you walk into a courtroom, you know the facts, you know the evidence, you know what you're going to ask, you know what you're going to say, but you're in front of 12 people you've never met before. 12 jurors who probably don't want to be there. 12 people that have preconceived notions about what life's like, what should or shouldn't happen in a courtroom. And everything that you and I do comes down to whether or not we can gain the trust of those 12 people, whether we can establish ourselves as being the leaders in the courtroom, and whether or not we can get them 
to uh, listen to the facts, to weigh the evidence, to find in favor of our client. And um, what I've noticed is people like you, good trial lawyers that have the ability to do that, um, I think also have the ability to share this portion of who they are on the social media platforms. And, you know, frankly, it applies to doctors and CPAs, any professional, any business owner. If you give yourself permission to share your human side on social, especially this week, especially right now, I think you can connect and help consumers and help our society and help our community move forward with the challenges that we're all facing. For me, going back to square one, understanding all of that, it was probably Twitter. You know, In addition to the website and blogging and things like this, when social media started rolling out, I remember uh, jumping on Twitter early. I remember doing videos uh, fairly early and sharing those videos on different platforms that were around back during those days. And by reminding myself to share a different type of post on Twitter, something about me as a human being or the Rotary Club that I'm involved with here in Orange County or one of the other community service events that we're involved with uh, and sharing that and getting other people involved, it allowed me to make new connections, it allowed me to make new friends, it allowed us to bring new clients and referrals into the law firm and do the all the things that we wanted to do as lawyers. And uh, so probably Twitter's where we started off, Eric, using that same type of mindset you and I use in the courtrooms today. Now, one of the things I've noticed is that you are not afraid on Twitter to go ahead and mention a political belief or political position. And as we know, there is often the warning that people will give when it comes to marketing and business that sure. you don't want to lay that out because you're going to offend the group of people and they're not going to be there. So is one of the reasons that you were so open like that on Twitter and other platforms because you're now successful enough to where you don't worry about it? Or if Twitter had been around when you were first starting off, would you have done the same thing? I don't know if I would have done the same thing because I don't think I had the same uh, mindset, the same level of confidence that I do today. But the reason I do that is because it's the right, I believe it's the right thing for me to do. You know, I, I shared with you why I became a lawyer. Yeah. And if that's the reason I became a lawyer and I'm not talking about things that matter to me, then, then really what's the point? And I will tell everyone, you, you need to do what you're comfortable with doing. I will tell you that by drawing a line in the sand and taking a position on, you know, on a political issue or a business issue or a social media issue or maybe a trial lawyer issue with the courts on new legislation, on new laws. I mean, actually having a, an opinion on something that's happening, something that's current, on breaking news. I think it does allow you to create a community of people who uh, know, like, and trust you. They share your values. They now know where you're coming from. And with that knowledge and additional information, they can trust you. And you're the person they're gonna, going to go to for a legal challenge, or if they have to refer someone to your office, you know what? You got to give Mitch a call. I don't know if he handles that type of law, but if he if he can, he'll help you. And if he can't, he'll refer you to someone who who will be able to help you. I trust what he's telling you. I mean, for me, it's just about being real. Now, it's being strategically transparent, right? In other words, when I go on and talk about politics, I like to do my research. I want to understand both sides of the discussion, make sure I'm sharing facts and be prepared, right? Just like you and I would do during an opening statement. I also understand that by the time I'm done, I've probably alienated 50% of the people who don't already know me, but, but on the other side of the coin, I'm 10Xing, I'm bringing in 10 times more people that can relate to where I'm coming from. The key, Eric, as you well know, is to be tough on issues and kind to people. I try to be tough on issues, but I don't try to uh, go after someone for how they look or what they're wearing, or or maybe even how they said something, okay? It has more to do with the facts regarding the issue as opposed to being unnecessarily cruel to any one person. Yeah, I, um, I've mentioned before when I started out, that was one of the mistakes I made on cross-examination that I thought everybody needed to be beaten up. Yeah. Um, and then you learn that, no, not everybody needs to be beaten up. You gotta wait till you have the people who are asking to be beaten up 
there's a beat up on them and everybody else. You just get the information and let them go on about their way. You got to know when to drop gloves, right? Yeah. And so you, with your background as a professional wrestler, which I always bring up, and I just think that's fascinating. And, and because look, we're all entertainers. We're all um, bringing a product you know, into the ring. We're all bringing a product into the courtroom. And you learn through doing the things that you've done in the past, the things I've done, when it's time to drop gloves and when it's time not to drop gloves. Part of my experience was working as a waiter, bartender in front door at a college bar in Tucson when I went to the University of Arizona was learning how to interact with people. People who either were sober and kind and courteous or who had had a few drinks uh, and felt they were bigger and badder than they really were, you know, at one or two in the morning, right? And and learning how to deal with those types of individuals. And what you learn, especially when you're cross-examining a witness, is those are your witnesses. There's a time and place to go after somebody, and there's a time and place to let that witness's silence speak for itself. The jury's going to figure it out. And I'll just share a little story with you. I had a, a wrongful death case where I... I uh, to, yeah, just sure. real quick, I had a wrongful death case where a uh, tragic case, and I don't want to get into the specifics, but I had a witness on the stand where my clients, mom and dad, who were with me in the courtroom, understood my strategy with this witness. I needed her to testify to something, and then I wanted to get her off the stand. Yeah. A family friend who came in and wasn't aware of the strategy really watched me being courteous to a third-party witness who watched something happen and thank her for her testimony and let her step down and leave the courtroom. And during the break, she came at, at me during the break, like, why did you do that? Why didn't you go after? I mean, she was angry. And, you know, I had to kind of bite my tongue and let her know there was a strategy to what we were doing. And sometimes we have to pick and choose, you know, our battles. And I felt that with my client's best interest to in mind, this was an opportunity for me to get this fact established and then move on with the case. I promised her if she stuck around, she would get those right hooks that she's looking for, but I was saving them for the defendant, not for this third party recipient witness. You know, you know, Mitch, you bring up a point that now makes me think of something very important. That is, we've discussed storytelling talking about jurors. We discussed storytelling talking about, uh, you know, governmental boards. I discussed that with Alex Sharon in, in episode one. We discussed it with potential clients, but let's talk about storytelling to your client when you're talking about this is the story of the trial. How are you going about getting the story of the trial across to your client before the client, before the trial begins and during the trial so that you're able to minimize their misunderstanding or lack of understanding and get them confident as to, okay, I see where you're going. So first of all, I want to say hi to Jenny Q for joining us, an amazing oh. human being. Hey, Jenny Q. Um, you know, here's the thing. What, what I found is most of the cases we handle, Eric, are life-changing cases or catastrophic injury, wrongful death cases mm -hmm. where someone, you know, someone's life's been turned upside down because of the wrongdoing of someone else. And, and business litigation matters where a company's life, the, 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 whether or not a company's going to be able to continue to exist yeah. Uh, happens. So what I like to do is I like to give my clients the opportunity to share their story. Instead of being the lawyer telling them what's going to happen, I'll ask open-ended questions. Tell me what happened. And then what did you do? And I try to listen. Uh, I try to participate in active listening and use my heart and really, really try to get into what their story is. What I found, Eric, is after someone's had the opportunity to tell their story, and, and there's somebody here, me, that cares about what just happened to them. Once that's done, then they're receptive to me talking to them about what we need to do next, whether it's what type of pleadings do we file, how are we going to be handling the litigation and discovery aspects of the case, what will be the things that I'm thinking about presenting during a trial right now. Uh, and it may change between now and the next two years to give them the best chance of accomplishing the goal that they're looking to accomplish. I want to make sure their goal is the same goal as my goal. So what we usually do is uh, take them by the hand and then walk them through the process. And we listen more than we speak at the beginning of the case to get them comfortable with what's going to happen next. I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but that's the process we go through. Well, in a lot of ways, Mitch, it, it does. Because one of the things, we again, we're talking about is getting people to understand where things need to go. And mm -hmm. with a jury, obviously, one of the things that we're trying to do is, for me, on the prosecution end, 
my view, of course, was this is why I'm going to ask you to vote guilty. Here's the story we're going to tell you. The evidence is going to show this. Mm -hmm. On the defense side, it may be along the lines of the several of the facts the prosecution has just told you are true, but that's not what the real story is. Here's where the story really goes, and you're going to see that. Um, with the client, I find the same way because we've often had this client to come in and say, I, I should get a million and a half dollars. <laughs> you have to explain mm -hmm. to them why. That may right. not be the story. Um, you know, that may not be how we get there. What we want to do is get your story across and make sure that you get the value for what that story is. And I know for me, particularly on criminal end as opposed to civil, I might start with a client asking, okay, this is what the police say happened. And then go through it with them and then say, how much of that is accurate? Hmm. Yeah, there's there's power in facts, yeah. right? There's power in facts and and listening to what your client has to say. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, just just approaching it from a different perspective. Sure. I I have found that when I know my client's story, when I understand where they're coming from, when if I'm representing somebody who um, has been paralyzed because of an accident, uh, I know that if I go to their home and I spend time with them and see what it takes for them to get out of bed in the morning and use the bathroom. And, and, and then, you know, it takes them three hours from getting out of bed and using the bathroom and getting ready to when they can have breakfast, something I can do in five minutes and watching them and helping them and staying with them and, and seeing what they do throughout the course of a day. In the case I posted uh, earlier this week, which is kind of similar to what's going down right now across the country, uh, where we had the opportunity to help a family. Um, and like I said, in Riverside County, um, it was a matter of uh, spending a lot of time with the family and getting to know everyone and, and visiting them at the house and uh, really just not talking but listening to their story and understanding where they're coming from. And then once you understand and appreciate all of those factors, putting them together in a way that satisfies the evidence requirements, that satisfies the jury instructions, so that you can present all of this in a way that's not only done in a, in, a, in a powerful storytelling fashion, because jurors love hearing stories, real stories of real people. They don't like to be talked to. They don't like to feel like they're sitting in a classroom being instructed to. What they like is feeling as though they're hearing your client's story. And that's super important. And so by doing all the things we talked about, it allows you at the time of trial, starting at jury instruction, starting with jury selection, voir dire, where you start telling your client's story in the form of an open-ended question that starts planting seeds and it starts getting everybody thinking, wow, if I was in, if I was sitting over there at council table next to Mr. Jackson, I would want to know what the answer is to that question. I want to know what the juror next to me thinks. I want to know what the juror sitting down in front of me thinks. This is really important stuff. Telling a story is critically important, but there's one thing that's more important than telling, I think, a powerful story in the courtroom, and that is empowering your jury to make the decision that you need them to make. It's one thing for a jury to be entertained, to be <clears throat> interested in what's happening in the courtroom. It's another thing to give them the power, to give themselves permission so that when they leave the courtroom and they go back into the jury deliberation room and you don't see them again, that's it. Uh, you want to make sure there are leaders back in that jury deliberation room that understand the facts, that have the power and persuasive ability to get everyone to come to the right decision. They've been empowered to take things to that next step to send a message to the community, to send a message to the defendant that what happened isn't okay, to tell your clients that your client's son did nothing wrong and that the damages that you're looking for are reasonable and necessarily necessary in this particular case. So yeah. it's telling a good story, but then empowering your audience to take the right action. Yeah, that brings me to two areas. So I'm going to try and take it one at a time. One was when you were talking about going to your your client's home, seeing how long it takes them to get up, get out, to essentially be able to tell the story of this is what they could do before, but they can't do it now, and it's that person's fault. Um, I'm reminded of what all my BC law classmates will know exactly what I'm talking about when I say this. One of the things that our property professor told us back when we were you know, just first-year law students, you know, little, little, itty bitty one ales, 
uh, Zygmunt Plotter, who used to say all the time, walk the land, walk mm -hmm. the land. The idea being that if a case came up, your job was to go exactly to where it went, yeah. see what's being talked about, start to get the feel for it because you can make it easier for, for others. Um, and so I think that's a wonderful point that you have, that that's one of the things we have to do. And I know as prosecutors, one of the things I learned was you can't always depend upon the investigators, particularly the cops, to give the layout. Sometimes you got to go yourself, or if you're lucky, you have an investigator that you really trust who goes and brings you everything. I mean, I, when I was at the Shasta DA's office, I got to admit, I had a couple of investigators who were fantastic. They would just bring me all this great stuff. And there's investigators I use now on the private side who do it. Um, but the other thing I want to get to was you were talking about four deer and a lot of people don't really get that sometimes jury selection is really jury deselection. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is depending upon the jury instructions. So let's talk a little bit about how you go about figuring out who on the jury as they're giving you a story. Cause after all, if we're we're trying to get their story within the, the confines that the court is giving us, how do you figure out from their story, whether or not this is somebody who should be sitting on this jury? Yeah, it's tough. You know, when you talk about walking the land, right, it takes mm -hmm. time and effort to do that. Whether you're visiting a an accident scene, you're going to a client's home, uh, or you're spending time just meeting with clients and their family members in your office and getting to know everybody or having dinner at their home. A lot of lawyers don't take the time to do that. And that's the difference between winning and, and losing a big case. And I say that because during jury selection, during voir dire, after walking the land, after understanding the nuances, after realizing what's in the police report or the investigator's report is actually different than what you observe, than what you saw, than what you heard, because you went there, you spent time doing yeah. something. Then what you're looking for in a jury is you're looking for jurors that have an open mind. In other words, they want all the answers. They don't want to be surprised by something. If they don't want to make, they don't want a situation to happen where they're being told one thing and then they find out later it's not the truth. So, in the scenario that we're talking about, what I look for are jurors who I feel after asking them questions, if they're if information is withheld from them, they're not going to be happy about it. So they're no. going to hold that against the other side. If they're the type of personality where once we get all the information, Mitch, we're going to make a full and fair decision, then that's that's who I want on my jury, especially in that type of case, because I realize I've, I'm holding a couple of cards, some things I've learned, I've seen, I've watched that the other side isn't focusing on, and they're not going to bring up a trial. So I want to make sure I've got that type of juror on my jury, for example. The other thing is to... Uh, not to tell the jury what they should be thinking. Let's talk about tort reform. When we're picking a jury, and most of my cases involve money damages. Yeah. Um, so when I'm talking to my jury, I spend a lot of time talking about tort reform and how many of you feel that money damages can make a difference in my client's life. And, and I want them to honestly answer the questions, right? And we dive deep into this. And it gives me an opportunity not to explain the value of money damages, but to really get a sense and a feel for where they sit before hearing any of the facts or evidence on this issue. Are they open-minded? Are they all the way over to one side or the other? You know, what are we dealing with? Uh, we had a case, Eric, where one of the cases that you were nice enough to mention, where we created some new law in California on uh, if you're a pet owner and somebody yep. intentionally harms your pet and you suffer emotional damages because of that, uh, you can now go after the person who intentionally harmed your pet. In our case, our, our, our client's dog was hit by a baseball bat intentionally. And up until that point, you couldn't go after someone for intentional infliction of emotional distress mm -hmm. to your pet. So we had a case, and on my jury, when I'm picking my jury, and you tell me how this happened. I, I On my jury, and who I thought would be the jury for person, was a female Los Angeles County Sheriff deputy who had just told me she spent over, she and her partner had spent over $10,000 on veterinary bills, having their dogs surgery taken care of, right? So this person obviously loved her dog. Yeah, as, as a defense attorney, you should never let that person on this jury. She was, she ended up being my four person. <laughs> So, so, and then I had someone else on the jury that also was just uh, passionate about uh, their pet and, uh, you know, there's no amount of money they wouldn't spend to keep their animal alive, right? We talked about these things Definitely. and it gives you a, 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 an idea of where people's heads are at. 
And um, so from my perspective, I'm thinking, okay, these are exactly the compassionate, pet loving people that I want on my jury. I have no idea what the other side was thinking of because you know they allowed these people to remain on the jury. And as it turned out, they were very instrumental to the verdict that we brought home to our clients. But it's, it's interesting, a, Eric, because like it's not always I, that it's not always that clear, right? Yeah, to me, it's it's like allowing a uh, an elementary school teacher to be on a child molestation case, mm. you know, or, a just, or a doctor on a medical malpractice case. Oh God, yes, yes, and Lord knows I never let a lawyer on any of my juries at any point in time. Um, but but this comes back to again part of what we're talking about is the more you know people's stories, the more you start to figure out where they may come across in a variety of spectrums as to whether or not you want to have them on their uh, juries. I know for me, for example, uh, there are certain things, as you know, jurors will show up into a jury uh, to show up for jury duty and they'll have reading materials with them. And sometimes I will notice for certain reading materials, I will kick those people off the jury immediately. I, I will not let them on. I won't do it because there's something about the reading material that makes me think that they may not be the best juror for this particular kind of thing. Interesting. Um, Oh yeah, regardless, always, regardless of their answers, it's it's yeah, just a deal answer. breaker for you. Okay, it, I get that. Yeah, and I think that part of that too becomes with the just as I I learned from one of my early trainers in wrestling that the the show starts when you wake up. I think what some jurors aren't aware of is the show started when they woke up. The show started when they showed up, and so I myself am always looking at you know, what they've got. Um, in addition to because we all judge obviously on what they're wearing. Um, obviously their answers, but I find that sometimes the other things are the things that you know, no one wants to sit, sit there, for example, and say, as they are talking, um, that they have certain tendencies that may make them look as if they're biased or bigoted or anything like that. They don't want that. Right, right. Um, in some cases they can't admit to themselves, but in other cases, they just don't want that to be seen. But if I turn around and I see a book that you're reading, and I know this may offend a few people, so, you know, but God help you. I'm sorry if if you're reading a book written by Bill O'Reilly. I'm that's supposedly a history book. I'm not going to let you on my jury. <laughs> I'm going to agree with you on that one, Eric. You know what's you know what's interesting is what's interesting is something not as obvious as that. Yes. <clears throat> but differentiating between is somebody just bringing some material because they've got to sit around all day to be a juror, right? And they're yes. just as opposed to this is something that they deeply believe in. Yes. And and it's not always that easy to figure these things out. Well, with that one I have because if that's what you're choosing for your reading, now again that that's one is yes, I yeah agree. that one is. Now yeah. if for example someone is reading something by George Will, so I want people to know that this isn't a political spectrum thing, that's not going to have an impact on me. You know, that's a George true. Will is going to be a different from a a Bill O'Reilly, you know, historical picture um, because he's a terrible historian, um, and that's that's kind of what that boils and, down. to. And you want you want to you want to make sure you're you're thinking of the same things with how your yeah. client comes across too, exactly, right? Or how we come across. You know, I, I think I talked to you earlier about this. Maybe I haven't, but when I'm trying a case, from the moment I pull into the parking lot and get out of my car, to walking into the courthouse, there's usually an attorney line and a uh, public line. Yes. Oftentimes I'll stand in the public line with my client. We'll meet and walk in together. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything or say anything that's going to uh, cast any type of predisposed idea about who I am to a potential juror. And all of these people could be potential jurors. We don't know who they are Yes. and how I interact with my client, how the respect that I show my client. Um, all of these things are part of a trial process in my mind. I, I mean, you tell me, it's funny how many times I've gone to the courthouse on big cases and I look at other attorneys laughing in the hallway, Yeah, you know, just, just talking about something they did that weekend as though nothing that's about to happen really matters. They don't care, you know, how rude they look when they walk into the courthouse, how rude they are to the bailiff or to the clerk in the courtroom. And then they expect these jurors or even the judge, you know, to, to give them the benefit of the doubt on a close call, whether it's a piece of evidence or a fact, or come back with a positive verdict in their favor. I just think everything we do is so darn important because of first impressions. Oh, so, and, and you may, you may agree with me on this. I say all the time, the most important person in that courtroom is the clerk. Yeah, if you, I if you piss off a judge's clerk, you're dead. I agree. You're, I agree. You're dead. You're I, dead. Learned, I learned that week one, week yeah. one, my friend, Absolutely. And the, bailiff, the bailiff's a close second, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, along the lines of the, I know for myself with whenever I'm dealing with the 
court security or the bailiffs. My view is always, look, this is, you know, it's my show, but it's their courtroom. So if they want me to stand over here, I'm going to yeah. stand over here. If they want me to step back 30 feet, I'm going to step back 30 feet because I also recognize that their role above everything else is protecting the judge. I get that. I understand that. And, a, and an orderly transfer of, of prisoners from one place to the next. I get that. Um, you know, and I think that that's one thing that people forget sometimes is you have to, and we've seen it a lot, people who come into a new courtroom, they're from out yeah. of town, and sometimes they like to, I've, I saw this happen in, <laughs> in Massachusetts, in Lowell, Massachusetts, no, Malden, Massachusetts, I remember. Um, actually, no, it was Lowell, which is kind of northern Massachusetts. Uh, and they're, they're a little distant from uh, from Boston. And I remember a lawyer who came in from Boston essentially tried to do, look, you know, I've got all this stuff happening. I got this. I need priority. I need this, that, and the other. And uh, watching the clerk say, oh, sure, no problem. Glad to help you. You know, so, and what case was that again? Uh, mentions the name, you know, Commonwealth v. Smith. He says, great, got it. And I saw the clerk go, take that file from here and stick it right at the bottom. Ooh. Just right there. <laughs> so that fifteen minute that fifteen minute hearing turned into a two and a half hour long yes, experience. Exactly, yeah, that happens. A long experience. So, and, so, you know, I can't blame can't blame him for it because again, yeah. it's the the respectful aspect is always helpful. I mean, there's a time to fight. Like I've been known on occasion to fight with judges because I'm not of the opinion that it's my job to make them happy. A, a judge taught me that when I was younger. It's not your job to make me happy. But there's never a reason to fight with the bailiff. There's never a reason to fight with the clerk. There's never a reason to fight with the court reporter, though I could be snarky from time to time. Um, but it's those a are fine line. Here. Yeah. Sometimes it's a fine line. You know, you got to play the part. You got to do what you have to do because we're representing our clients. I'll tell you a little secret that uh, I don't know if I picked this up reading one of Jerry Spence's uh, books back in the day or someone told me this, but it's, it has to do with visiting the courtroom ahead of time. Yeah. And understanding walking into the courtroom a week before your trial. And if you have if you're not familiar with the judge or the clerk of the courtroom, but get there early and talk to the court staff. What's what are the judge's thoughts with should I be standing or sitting when asking a question or placing an objection? Would the judge like us to stand or sit when everyone comes in the courtroom? Where do you not want me to stand other than the well? And the well, you guys, is between the counsel table and the judge's bench. You're not supposed to walk in there without the judge's permission. Unless the judge tells you it's okay to do it, yeah. each judge is different. But you want to find out what the rules are uh, before you start your trial. And you want to find out, at least back in the day, uh, where you could plug in your electronics, when it was okay to use the court projector or overhead. Uh, you know, it's just little things that if you, if you make ha a habit out of doing the foundational work, when you are in trial, you're not going to make that mistake. You're not going to walk someplace or do something that's going to offend anyone. And like you said, if you are from out of town and you don't know that judge and you don't know how he or she wants to run their courtroom and you consistently do something that violates that courtroom's rules, the judge is going to let you know about it. And if you do it often enough, he or she's going to let you know about it in front of the jury. Okay. Now, you don't want that. You don't want that to happen. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Maybe embarrassing. And if you decline that, if you decline to answer, Mitch, I completely understand. Anything for you, Eric. You know I got your back. Okay. I yeah. have of the 58 counties in California. I think I've appeared in about 34, 35 of them, and almost to a person, the attorneys hate hearing that they're about to get lawyers coming in from LA County or from particularly the city of Los Angeles, or from Orange County. Really? really? There's a reputation across the state that those guys are dicks. Um, and what's funny to me is you are, of course, one of the nicest guys I've ever come across. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, how do you deal with difficult attorneys? Or is it that being in Orange County yourself, you don't see it the same way? Eric, remember when you were in high school? Yes. All the cute looking girls were at the other high school on the other side of town. No, no, no. All the cute looking girls were at Long Beach Poly High School. Is that where you went? Yeah, that, I'm going to say uh, that. Good, good answer. Good answer. So so here's the thing, you guys. My first year in college, yeah. uh, I ran into a guy. We immediately hit it off, became good friends. And it turns out he was his class president of his high school, which was on the other side of town. And that's where we thought all the cute girls. We had a lot of cute girls in our high school, but that's where we thought all the cute girls were. 
what Oscar told me is, no, no, Mitch, all the cute girls were on your side of town at your high school, right? <laughs> so, so it's off, you know, it's interesting because I look at all my friends in Orange County and I can, I can say almost without any exceptions whatsoever, just an amazing group of human beings. I mean, really nice people, really good lawyers. Uh, I haven't seen that, but having said that, I know everybody. Right, it's that next layer. Yeah. Um, I will tell you that on a couple of <clears throat> appeals up in LA County, um, and I don't remember why I was arguing appeals up in LA County, but the appellate justices up there were a challenge. Right, and and I just remember thinking to myself, "Wow, you know, not only am, am I in the right, and I'm simply I'm like uh, on the I'm opposing the other side's appeal because they didn't like what happened at the trial level." Yeah. But uh, to call me out and say some of the things that they said, I mean, what's the point? And I had one appellate justice talk to me about why I was basically busting the balls of the insurance company. Like, why am I pushing this to the limit that we're pushing it, right? And long story short, my, my response was, we're simply asking the insurance company to do what the rest of us are required to do under the Code of Civil Procedure procedural issue no more and no less less but you know it's like why even say something like that you know? Well, you know that's one of the odd things i found because in in massachusetts where i also practice judges are appointed for life so so you're not really all that surprised when they say occasionally something that might be a little a little different uh, or i should say they're appointed I, I think the retirement age now is 70 there it was just maybe. over and over i'm like come on yeah uh, including, I remember once uh, appearing in Lowell in front of a judge who's now retired, um, and mentioning a case, you know, from the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, uh, and looking at me and saying, "Oh, the SJC, they're all the way in Boston, Mr. Anderson. We don't need to worry about them." <laughs> but, so, uh, so, I, so, well, I have, so but, I had an, I, I just go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah, but I find it odd to come across some of that on occasion here. I remember mm -hmm. once practicing in Shasta County, um, and those in Shasta already know this story because I've said it a million times, and having a judge say in a, a case as we were in chambers who said, this case is a waste of the jury's time. And it's a criminal case. And the judge and I then got into it because one of the things I told him was, and I was the prosecutor in the case, I said, no, no, no. So, you know, the jury's job is to sit here and hear the evidence. The decision to have a trial belongs only to the defendant. He has exercised that right. And for you to say that this is a waste of the jury's time is ridiculous. Um, yeah, he that judge and I occasionally had a few a few issues from time to time. Well, but you have to move past it, right? You yeah, have exactly. To move past Sometimes it. you have to move past it. Uh, so and that's a hard thing. That was a hard thing for me to learn for a while. It's, it's funny how <clears throat> you... Once again, I've always fall back on my life experiences as a, as a bartender, a waiter, front door guy, when I deal with people like that. Like, I don't take it personal, right? It's like, what's in my client's best interest? I was out in your neck of the wood at the uh, Riverside Appellate Court. Oh, yeah. Or whatever. All right. And it was, and uh, we were arguing. Setup, by the way, for those who haven't seen it, it's a beautiful setup. And we were arguing over uh, the amount of money damages that a jury awarded my client, right? The other side said the award was too too big. And these are the kinds of problems you want to have as a plaintiff's attorney. So they're trying to get us to agree to reduce the amount of the jury verdict. Yeah. And we were refu refusing to do that. So sure. we walk outside and it was actually a mediation settlement, uh, appellate level settlement conference. And the appellate justice who was handling the appellate conference, we all walk outside. He's got his cowboy boots on. He lights up a cigarette. We're sitting out, standing in front of this with the clients and opposing counsel. He looks at me and takes a puff and he goes, Mr. Jackson, out here we do things a little differently than we do back in Orange County. So he's felt the same way you did about Orange yeah. County lawyers. Takes a puff, throws a cigarette on the ground, which kind of pissed me off. I'm like, oh, I felt sure. like going, quit littering, but I didn't. Yeah. And we went in back inside and we did not settle the issue. It mm -hmm. went up on appeal on some issues. Um, but it's funny how if that was somebody at eight o'clock at night getting in my face, treating me the way he treated me, it wouldn't have ended with him just throwing that cigarette on the ground. It would have either yeah. ended with an apology or, or, or something else would have yeah. happened. But you have to learn as a lawyer that when we meet people that for whatever reason, maybe they're having a bad day, 
yeah. maybe they got in a fight that morning, you know, at home. I don't know. Uh, but you, you realize, you know, there's a point in time where you just got to keep your mouth shut, just smile, just give them a little nod, understand that we're, we're going to resolve it in court. We don't need to agree. Let's just agree to disagree. I think once I became a little bit older and wiser, Eric, and I realized yes. it's okay to agree to disagree, yeah. then um, it really took the stress off of being a lawyer because it's, lawyers are good at pushing buttons. Yeah. It's far easier for me to do that at 50 than it was when I was 30. You know, at, at 30, yeah. I was full of, as they say, piss and vinegar and, and ready to go and us. all that. Yeah. And, and now yeah. it's along the lines of I can take my, but you, you bring up a, an interesting point though, that I wonder, and that is um, as a civil plaintiff's attorney, let's walk through telling your client, yes, we won, but we still have to deal with someone saying you don't get to win as much as you thought you did. Right, right. Because that can't be a comfortable conversation. So let's talk about how do you yeah. approach that? From day one. Okay. From day one. From day one, uh, when you meet with the client, we talk about, we have our conversation like we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to handling the file, we talk about, look, uh, if the case doesn't settle, and these are the six different ways we can try to get the case resolved to your full satisfaction, then you know, trial, mediation, or arbitration are the next alternatives. And, uh, and we talk about the different pros and cons, what can happen at each of these hearings with respect to a jury trial. If a jury comes back with a verdict, what are the different things that can happen? The other side can bring a motion for new trial. They can bring a motion to set aside the verdict. Yes. They can do the same thing on appeal. There, there's a lot that can happen. So normally what we do is we talk about it and we usually, it's not a big deal. Everyone understands that there's still stuff that can happen with a case. I will tell you from a practice perspective, point of view, a practice pointer is we do put everything in writing so that we've documented everything we've talked to the client about so that there's full disclosure. But um, generally speaking, what my experiences have been, Eric, is at the end of a trial, the, the clients know that they've, they've seen me leave everything in the courtroom. They know I'm living that case 24 seven. I've given it my best. Um, I'm fortunate to have won most of my cases. I've tried somewhere around 70 superior court jury trial types of cases, not hearings, not four hour trials, but like 70 real trials. And out of those 70, I've won, I think about 67. I think I lost three, if I'm not mistaken. One of those we tried three times. Okay, the first trial was a mistrial. Second trial was a hung jury, and the third yeah. trial was a loss. As the jury's coming in on that third trial, the defense attorney leaned over to me and said, Mitch, I think you spanked me for about 750000 And I said, I think I did too. Because by the third trial, I, I know what his he's, arguments yeah, are. And, right, yeah. right, you got it down. And the jury came back on the question of whether or not the doctor was negligent, yes or no. The, the answer was no. He wasn't negligent. Case over. Yeah. And it was a, a case where the client was told on day one, this is a challenging case. They have a written uh, uh, waiver, consent yes. form, and we're going to need to get around this, and it's going to be tough. And so from day one, they knew it was going to be a challenging case, and so did I, but I thought we all thought it was mm -hmm. worth, for all the right reasons, to take it to trial, right? Mitch and and, and so what I'm getting at, though, yeah. is you, um, you kind of learn how to – you do the best that you can – and realize that there are things just beyond our control. And I think the more you communicate with your client on these issues, the more they feel like they're they're in it with you. They're yeah. part of your team. And so I've never they've never had a client be surprised about like that next step because they're already aware of it. Okay. You know, you, you brought up something when you mentioned the waiver. Um, and I know it wasn't one of the things we planned on talking about, but it did That's kind of spark my mind here. And that is people are signing waivers all the time, yeah, every day not looking at them, going through them. As a lawyer who's had to deal with the consequences of people signing waivers, what recommendation can you give people when they're faced with a waiver? Should they just arbitrarily sign it? Do they stop and take a look at it? Uh, do they say, I got to go to a lawyer about it? You know, what are kind of the issues yeah. you think that they should start being, as a society, more aggressive about? 
Yeah, I'll tell you what, it just depends on the nature of the transaction. When we're all out, you know, buying our smartphones, our cell phones, or signing up for new cell smartphone contracts, most of those have waivers, mm -hmm. arbitration, and mediation clauses in them. And we don't think twice about it. And personally, I don't I don't think twice about it. Whatever. I, I don't really care. Yeah. Uh, when we're doing laps at the motocross track, when we pull into the gate, we have to sign a waiver, uh, an assumption of risk and liability waiver in case we get hit by somebody else or we do something stupid and we break our neck. And I am one of those guys where I have no problem executing or signing those types of waivers in order to participate in the sports and activities that I enjoy doing. But that's just me. I think the general consumer needs to pay attention to when you're being asked to sign a waiver and if it's going to have the potential to affect your life in a negative way down the road, uh, you know, talk to somebody who you trust, talk to your family lawyer, talk to a lawyer in town to see whether or not it's in your best interest to sign the waivers. An easy workaround, Eric, is oftentimes when somebody pushes a clipboard across the counter, we need you to sign this. Just look at it. And if you don't want to sign it, just say, I'm not interested in signing the waiver. I'm not interested in agreeing to an arbitration mm -hmm. or mediation. I'd say 50% of the time, the person that you're dealing with says, okay, thank you. It's just yeah. office policy that we have to ask. So there's nothing wrong with rejecting a document that they're asking to sign and then seeing what happens next. Okay, so you understand that, ladies and gentlemen? Don't be afraid to say no. See what happens. I've actually heard of people signing the word, writing the word rejected on the signature line. It's not Perfect. even their signature. Rejected. Okay, and oftentimes the other person will take it back and I guess be under the uh, assumption that you agreed to the document when in fact you wrote in clear and concise language that you rejected it. I don't know if that would hold up in court, but I've seen a lot of people do that. Now, the other thing I want to get to, Mitch, as we come to the you know, the last portion of what we're dealing with is this. I, uh, yeah, I'm not nearly in the shape I used to be when I was younger. And the only time I get in shape, yeah, the only time I get in anything resembling shape is if I know there's a trial coming up about six weeks away, I start getting ready for kind of like a heavyweight championship fight. You know, suddenly I'm I'm moving more. I'm watching what I'm Good. eating better. I reduce the drinking thing. You are an avid runner. You do this all the time. In fact, often we will find on I think Instagram and maybe a few others where, uh, and certainly it was on on uh, Periscope, where yeah. first thing in the morning you're out there somewhere. You're out. You're, you're out on the beach. You're, you're running so or you're surfing. Uh, yeah. Tell us about what doing that does for you in preparation as not just a trial lawyer, but also as a trainer, which you certainly are. Uh, you, you know, you train so many people legally uh, and also as a business owner. So uh, just so you feel just so you know, you're not alone. I have the same challenges. I'm not the same, <laughs> you know, not the same person I was 20, 30 years ago. Here's the thing, and you've heard me share the story of Mike the Milkman, my father-in-law, yeah. who grew up uh, loading milk crates on the back of a milk truck. And by the time I met Mike 20 years later, he owned his own dairy distributorship in the Lancaster, Lancaster, California, Antelope Valley, and sold it at the age of 52 and retired. One of the nice. most successful guys I've ever met. Three beautiful daughters. I married the middle one. Yeah. But when we were pulling a ski boat and I asked Mike for permission to marry his daughter, he pulls over to the side of the road, stops the car truck looks at me and he goes, do you know Mike the Milkman's three keys to success? I'm like, no, but I have a feeling I'm about to hear him. <laughs> yeah, and so right. number one was take care of yourself physically mm -hmm. and mentally, because unless you're healthy, you're not going to be any good to yourself, to my daughter, to your family, to your clients, to anyone else. And this was, uh, this was a, two years after I started practicing law. We got married in 88. This is around 86, 87. Uh, number two, take care of your family. Take care of your wife, your family, your neighbors, and your friends. Number three, take care of your business and profession. Keep things in that order, and everything else will fall into place. Okay, easier said than done, right? Because we all have a lot of stuff going on. But but that's my that's my fallback. That's my default. And what I've noticed is, being a first generation lawyer, always uh, have been involved in in athletics and and, yeah. and different different sports. I just love doing different things. Um, I like challenges. What I noticed about practicing law is it's draining. It's physically draining and it's emotionally draining. And a lot of lawyers, at least back in the day, and I'm seeing it not be as big of a problem today, you know, you have substance abuse issues and challenges, right? You have, um, you know, the law is a jealous mistress. You see a lot of relationships falling apart, right? Because this takes a lot of time and attention. 
what I noticed is regardless of the activity, whether I'm going for a run, working you know, on the stair step, going to the gym, uh, riding the motocross bike, uh, paddle boarding down at the harbor, that hour or two that I'll spend doing that three to four times a week makes all the difference in my life. The endorphins kick in. It allows me to, you know, to, to just feel better as a human being. And it's not easy. Um, and it allows me the way my mind work is when I'm out there doing this stuff and we're doing, we had a group of us, Eric on Wednesday mornings that would do, um, we'd go down to Elsinore and, and ride the track. Uh, and there were about eight or 10 of us, uh, one or two judges here in Orange County. And we yeah. get down there at eight in the morning, you guys, and we'd ride the track till noon and then come back. Um, and what I noticed is while I was doing that, we, uh, I think about my cases and I think about my opening statement or my closing argument or a response that I needed to make to an objection that I, that I was anticipating opposing counsel making in the middle of the trial. And it allowed me to clear my head and come up with a response and come up with a story. While I'm doing these things, it, for me, it, it helps me think. But I'll be real with you, for uh, the first 10 or 15 years after we had kids, everything we did was, was around the kids, right? We had no spare time. I didn't have time to do any of this stuff. And I remember at one point about 10 years ago, thinking to myself, I need to get my butt back out there, right? And just, I need to, for me, running is just like an easy way to get back in shape. So I started running and I didn't make it out of our development before I was out of breath, tired, sucking eggs. I'm just I telling you, it was, it, it probably wasn't more than a quarter of a mile. I'm yeah, like, I can't make it out my driveway right now. what the heck, what the heck happened to me, right? And so the next day I got up and, and, and this is not early morning Rocky stuff. This is like when I felt like going for a run, I got up, I did whatever I needed to do. And then I'd go for a little run, a little, little bit further, five minutes further. The next day, five minutes further. The next day, five minutes further. And um, what I noticed is all of a sudden it started getting easier. All of a sudden started taking off the pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from the last time I saw you, Eric, I'm down like 45 pounds from the last time you and I had lunch together, just so you know. Yeah, I, I think I found half of those pounds. <laughs> you reason, wear it much better than I do. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that, that's my tailor. My tailor gets credit for that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're both two talented individuals. But the, the thing is, is what I've noticed is whatever I'm doing, whether it's reading a book, playing beer pong with my kid, going for a run, paddle boarding down at the harbor. Um, what I've noticed is it allows me to reset. It allows me to catch my breath. It allows me to be a better husband, a better father, a better lawyer, uh, a better friend. It's, it's by taking care of yourself allows you, I think, to do all those other things uh, more effectively, more efficiently, and in a better way. And um, look, I'm at the point where if I don't feel like going for a run, if I don't feel like working out, I don't. This is not something where I'm training for a heavyweight fight, but nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm at the point where I look forward to, to getting out and doing something. In fact, right after this, you know, we're shooting this during a COVID-19 world. We're still all working from home. I'm going to change. I'm going to go down. I'm going to get an hour in on, we have a, uh, it's called a life step, which is like a 20 year old stair stepper down in the man cave and we're going to go down there and my son's going to lift and I'm going to put in an hour on the stair step, watch a couple of ep episodes of the Sopranos on the tablet right there. And uh, to me, that sounds like a perfect way to spend lunch. It, it does. I well, mean, before we let me ask this question, uh, do you think we're going to get any USC football this year? So we just got an email yesterday. Yeah. Our son, you guys is in his second year at S he just finished his second year. Our daughter graduated from the at USC law school, yeah. old school of law. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm an Arizona Wildcat, so that has more to do with my wife than me, just so that we're yes. clear. Go Cats. But having said that, it looks like they're doing everything they can to try to open back up in August. And it's going to depend on what happens. What are the facts? You know, what, what's going to be going on with COVID-19? I know they would like to, and I think if everything continues the way it is right now, what I'm reading between the lines is yes. It looks like students will be on campus with full face mask. It looks like uh, everything's going to be a go, but they're trying to coordinate that with the Pac-12, you know, and uh, I've got my fingers crossed. I got my fingers crossed because I've got a heck of a quarterback. I think they're, I think they're ready. They're ready to move forward. And uh, 
it's going to be an exciting season. But you know, this is interesting mm-hmm. times, Eric. This is this is this is a time in life where I've talked to my kids, I've talked to my clients, my friends, mm-hmm. where I think we need to be proactive. We're living in a moment of history between COVID nineteen, but between uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, between everything we're seeing right now, um, where we can embrace it and learn from it and move forward and make make our society make our world a better place and i think this is the time in 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 our history when we all have an opportunity to do this and you guys have an opportunity to give yourself permission to to show your emotions Mm -hmm. to show your human side to tap into your networks tap into your connections and let's make change happen i'm so tired of talking about it and i'm ready to see something actually happen and Eric, one of the things that I'm scared about is when we have a school shooting, everybody's protesting, everybody's upset, everybody's trying to say the right thing, and then a year later, nothing's happened. Yes. Right? And you and I have been around long enough where we've lived through a lot of different experiences. And I feel like, I feel this is different. I just feel like it's different. And I'm hearing voices and sounds from people that I haven't heard from before. And I'm praying to God that that is the case. I'm hoping that this, the change is in the air and we're going to make this happen. I'm excited about our Gen Y and Gen Zs. I think they do care. And I think the youth of our country is the future of our country. And I can't wait to see, I personally can't wait to see what happens over the next 25 or 30 years. I hope it doesn't take more than six months. Gosh, I but hope I think, so. But I think you and I both know yeah. it's a generational <laughs> thing. But but um, I, I would love to see everyone embrace what we're going through right now and move forward in a positive fashion. As would I. Mitch, I want you to hang on. I'm going to go ahead and get ready to do this. Mitch, thank you so much You're welcome, for joining us. It has been a huge, just a, a great pleasure. I uh, love talking the war stories. love talking about how we're dealing with the streaming and the connections and getting people's stories. So that's been fantabulous. Uh, I want to thank all of you once again for joining us here on Wrestling with the Law and Stuff. I, I have to tell you. I was not in a good mood today. I was not in a good mood for much of the last few days. But you know, talking to Mitch uh, and uh, anytime there's anything that gets me excited over law is always great. So by all means, feel free to go ahead and reach out to the people who help you remember why you do what it is you do. We want you all to stay safe as much as possible. We also want you to make your voices heard no matter what it is you're doing. And we want to remind you, no matter what it is you're wrestling with, let's come and wrestle with it together. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.